Hello guys, Winston here. Lighting is important, not only for your own comfort, as eye strain can be a real problem in a dingy garage, but also for the quality of recorded videos. And as someone who makes a living producing content in a garage, I thought I was doing myself a favor by buying a bright LED light fixture from Costco and mounting it in my CNC enclosure. However, I soon discovered that not all lights are made equally. Cheap power rectifiers and dimmer circuits can cause noticeable flickering in captured footage if your shutter speed or frame rate doesn't divide evenly into your line or PWM frequency. Here is an example of the strobing you would see if you tried to shoot 120 or 240 FPS slow-mo footage of my CNC in action. And for shutter speeds other than 1 60th or 1 30th of a second, you would see moving lines across the image. Now, you might think this isn't a big deal, just lock your shutter at 1 60th of a second and don't shoot any slow-mo. But for cameras where you can't set a fixed shutter speed, you'll also get banding. This was most prominent in certain GoPro time lapses I took before I learned that I had to trick my GoPro into using a lower shutter speed by throwing on several ND filters. This wasn't ideal as it meant that the resulting image quality of my time lapses was reduced. So what's the solution here? Obviously, my lights suck but replacing this fixture with a different model or A19 bulbs would be a bit of a crapshoot. Maybe I would land one that used high quality circuitry, maybe I would get one that was actually worse. Most online reviews for consumer grade lighting products really don't cover this, so it's hard to know which lights are worth buying. I could alternatively spend hundreds of dollars on video ready lights, and that would be the quickest solution, but I could also expend a grotesque number of hours designing and building my own videography lighting solution. Naturally, as a cheapskate who undervalues my own time, I opted for the latter. Now, I'm not reinventing the wheel here. I'm building off the research of Matt from DIY Perks and the confirmation of my friend Alice, who made her own DIY video lights based on Matt's part list. These are the three basic elements in this build. One, high CRI LED strips that run at 12 volts. These will provide clean, consistent illumination without casting a weird tint on camera. Just because a light looks like a certain color to you doesn't mean that a camera sensor, which is interpolating only red, green, and blue channels, will come to the same conclusion. There's a great video on this by Indie Mogul, which I'll link to below, that explains why using RGB LEDs can ruin the color in your images. White LEDs that don't produce a pure or even spectral distribution will cause similar issues. So go for LEDs that have a CRI rating of 95 or better. 2. PWM Motor Controllers these use a rapidly oscillating signal to flicker a load on and off many times per second. LEDs don't respond to voltage modulation for dimming. You can't run a 12 volt LED at 6 volts for half the brightness, it'll just cut out. You need to modulate their duty cycle. To ensure that a camera won't pick this up as flickering though, you need to exceed the shutter speed by at least an order of magnitude. Most LED dimmer circuits will cause the light to flicker at anywhere from 400 to 1000 Hz. That's very easy to pick up at most modest shutter speeds and frame rates. This PWM controller operates at 10,000 Hz. You won't catch that on video without a phantom high-speed camera. Element number three is a 12 volt power supply. Based on my calculations, each light fixture I would be making would need a theoretical 2.8 amps to reach max brightness. However, that wouldn't account for losses in transmission, or in the dimmer circuit, or if a cheap 3 amp power adapter would even be able to meet its rated current. So to be safe, I budgeted 5 amps for each light. My enclosure would need two light fixtures, so a 10 amp power supply was ordered. You can put these ingredients together however you want, you could 3D print your own enclosure, you could cobble something together with hand tools, but you already know where this is going. I'm going to CNC all the things. Well, most of the things, but more on that later. When I first started designing my light bars, I knew I wanted a wide distribution of lighting to help minimize shadows. Just like how an overcast sky softens shadows, I wanted my lights to be spread out to help illuminate the workpiece underneath my CNC gantry. So I wanted either a single 4 foot wide light bar to span my enclosure, or two smaller ones. I ended up going with the latter architecture. These LEDs are going to get pretty toasty. Just based on ideal numbers, we're looking at about 34 watts of power dissipation per light. I decided that each light fixture would contain six 60 centimeter strips of LEDs. So these LEDs would need to be affixed to a conductive backing to help dissipate heat. That would give me a perfect excuse to shred some aluminum on the shape oko. I designed my light bar to be machinable from 3 inch wide aluminum bar stock an eighth of an inch thick. These dimensions would be brought down to about 75 and 3 millimeters respectively. I generally like to keep my projects in inches if I'm using domestically sourced stock, but LED strips are usually 10 millimeters wide and can be split every 50 millimeters. 
it just made sense to design around metric values here. On the back of my aluminum frame, I modeled in some pockets. I told myself that it was for weight savings, but I can't deny that my primary motivation was for this thing to look cool. I also added in mounting holes for my electronics enclosure, as well as a cutout to protect the wires going to the LED strips. My PWM dimmers would be housed in a die-cast enclosure. Normally, I would consider a plastic hobby enclosure for convenience because they're lightweight and you can drill into them however you want, but because my lights would be so long and narrow, the mounting interface to support my light bar would have to be on the enclosure itself. And I didn't trust plastic to support even the modest weight of my light bar. I also wanted to mount my lights via quarter 20 threads. That way, it would be compatible with all manner of camera accessories like tripods and articulating arms. The die-cast enclosure is too thin to reliably tap for such coarse threads, so I would machine an adapter plate that would accept a quarter 20 thread and distribute the static load of the light bar through an array of smaller tapped holes. At this point, I had enough of the design flushed out that I felt comfortable enough to start machining. I carefully cut down a 6 foot length of aluminum that I had picked up on McMaster Car on my miter saw. I still haven't gotten a better blade for it, but I'll probably just use this one until it goes dull. Then I taped down my aluminum to a little MDF template that I'd machined on my Shapeoko. This template provided me a machine leveled area and allowed me to position my stock with enough overhang on all sides. 3 inches is mighty close to 75mm, so I didn't have a lot of margin for error when aligning or zeroing my stock. The MDF also had clearance machined into it so that my end mill could overshoot the bottom of my stock to guarantee a clean cutout all the way through the aluminum. No onion skin, no problems. A quarter inch end mill made quick work of the relatively shallow pockets and I used a 1 16th inch end mill to bore out my smaller holes. After these machining operations, I touched all the faces with a deburring wheel to take the edges off my corners and also smooth out the raw extruded texture on my frames so that my LED strips would adhere better. I also tapped the mounting holes for my diecast enclosure for 632 threads. And then it was time to machine the die-cast enclosures themselves. These are challenging to work hold because they're formed with a draft angle. None of the walls are at perfect right angles to each other or the bottom. However, because the walls are of a relatively uniform thickness, I could just clamp one wall to a block of MDF with plenty of room underneath for the rest of the enclosure to overhang. I used a slip of paper to help me find the center of the enclosure to help me set my zero. I was initially hesitant about machining this aluminum since it was a mystery alloy. Die-cast aluminum has very different mechanical properties that are optimized to help it flow at high temperatures and resist cracking, but it also tends to be a softer, gummier alloy. I figured that with a single flute end mill and a shallow depth of cut so I could maintain a decent inch per tooth, I could shave off good chips that wouldn't clog my cutter. Turns out, I was probably overthinking it because this stuff cut just like any other alloy of aluminum as far as I could tell. I used some physical stops to help me align the enclosures since I would be making more than one. You can see that this project was during my early days of recovering from a dislocated shoulder. I had been working on this project on and off since about December 2019, making little bits of progress here and there while I worked out the next steps in my head. The bottom of the enclosure was the easiest to machine since I didn't need to use any janky fixtures to support it. There was one hole on the long end of the enclosure that was just faster to drill by hand. With the majority of the machining done, it was time for integration of all my parts. I began by installing a female coaxial plug in the enclosure. To that, I soldered on a pair each of positive and negative leads. These would go to the input side of the PWM controllers I would be installing next. There was no fancy strategy for mounting them, I was just going to use the threaded shaft of the potentiometer housing to secure the controllers to the enclosure. I made some extra enclosures so that I could power additional light fixtures in the future. The cost of making a few extras in this case is minuscule compared to the amount of time I spent planning this project and preparing my setups. I was pretty confident I would be able to use these in the future. Next, it was time to attach my LED strips. I cut a bunch of 600mm lengths of LEDs in two colors, 3000 Kelvin warm white and 5600 Kelvin bright white. I expected to use bright white most of the time, but sometimes you want to give yourself options. Plus, at night, sometimes those warmer colors are nice. They help you feel like you're not in a sterile surgical ward. I arranged these LED strips in alternating rows. 
At the ends of the LED strips, I dabbed on some Starbomb Thick CA glue. <clears throat> Discount code in the description. This was to prevent the exposed copper substrate in the LED strips from potentially shorting out against the aluminum frame. If I'd been able to anodize these aluminum frames though, that wouldn't have been a concern. To wire these up to my PWM controllers, I ran two pairs of wires cut, one for the bright white LEDs and one for warm white. Because the LEDs in the strip are wired in parallel, you can tap into these strips anywhere you want. I chose the middle so that I would have the shortest run of wires between the PWM controllers and the strips. I found that I had the best results if I scraped the pads clean with a dull utility blade and tinned them first. I also linked up additional strips from as close to the previous connection point as possible. If I had wired up my LEDs with the flow of electricity going in an S pattern, a little bit of power would have been wasted going through a longer distance of that strip. Where possible, I made use of the existing solder joints where the factory had linked shorter lengths of LED strips together. This probably isn't the prettiest bit of electronics work you've seen on YouTube, but I've never claimed to be any good at this kind of stuff. The only reason I felt up to do this project was because it didn't involve any digital circuit design. With my light modules assembled and able to be turned on, I was finally able to assess their effectiveness. And they were adequately bright, and the dimming function and blending of the two different color temperatures worked great. However, the harshness of each individual LED left a lot to be desired. Even if I wasn't looking directly at them, I knew that if I was machining aluminum or my lens had line of sight to the LED fixture, I would be able to observe the individual specs of the LEDs in the captured reflection or glare. Plus, these LED strips aren't waterproof, not that I was planning on splashing them with water, but that meant they also wouldn't be resistant to things like dust and aluminum chips. So I needed a shield and a diffuser in front of my LED strips. I could have used something like standoffs to support a sheet in front of the lights, but I wanted to do a better job of sealing out dust from reaching my lights. I agonized over how best to suspend a diffuser in front of my frame and enclose the lights. I would need some sort of U-shaped channel that would go around the perimeter of my frame. There was no off-the-shelf extrusion that would have worked here, and machining a shape like this from solid stock would have been obscenely wasteful. That left me with only one option, one that I had been dreading for years. I needed to buy a 3D printer. And I know, there are plenty of you who say that it's absolutely okay. It's not a betrayal of my deepest held beliefs. Additive and subtractive manufacturing can coexist together. And you're right. But I've clung to this subtractive first mentality for so long because it was a limitation that forced me to be creative in how I design and manufacture, especially in my formative years of learning how to CNC, where I needed that push to continue to try new things. I love that challenge and satisfaction from creating a finished product forged from traditional materials and processes. But in this case, I had to accept that there are some cases where additive manufacturing is legitimately the most efficient way to go particularly in structures whose box volumes are mostly empty space. Although I could have tried to sneak in a print using the Ultimakers we have at work, I decided that the flexibility of owning my own printer and its print schedule was worthwhile. I ended up buying a Creality Ender 5 Pro. I designed my plastic bezel in segments and printed out a couple sets. The first iteration was basically a learning experience. I was figuring out how much dimensional tolerance to build into the print. It turns out I should have allowed for a couple more tenths of a millimeter of margin for tight-fitting features. I also discovered that in the middle where my wires were routed under the aluminum that I needed a cutout in my bezel piece in order to accommodate the wires. Once I had a good working bezel, I match drilled some holes and used rivets to secure the bezel to the aluminum heatsink. This is one area where better planning would have saved me a good deal of manual labor. These holes would have been way easier to machine on my Shapeoko, but the necessity of the bezel and the diffuser hadn't been established in my head until I saw the prototype light bar lit up for the first time. At the end of the frame, I used tapped holes so that if necessary, I could remove the diffuser, which would be a 1 16th inch sheet of white HDPE. This stuff is lightweight, cuts easily, and much cheaper than acrylic and polycarbonate. I machined out my panels using a Harvey Tool 2 flute low helix plastic cutting end mill and a combination of double sided tape and mechanical clamping. It cut extremely well. The last major piece of the puzzle was my mounting interface, how I would suspend my light bars. I machined these blocks from a quarter inch plate of aluminum and tapped the center hole for quarter 20. These fit perfectly onto my extrusion's walls and felt more than secure enough with the load spread across four screws. 
Some additional last minute pieces I made to complete this project were 3D printed brackets to mount my 10 amp power brick under my enclosure, and a splitter slash extender to reach both my lights. As an inept mechanical engineer, this took me a little longer than it should have, and it's not quite up to NASA's standards for splicing wires, but I got the job done eventually. And with two threaded inserts driven into my enclosure from above, I was finished. The quality and evenness of the lighting is exceptional. I do wish I had a couple hundred more lumens to throw, but running solely from my 5600 Kelvin lights and drawing about 36 watts to my original fixtures 40, the illumination is just as good as it was before. The heat sinks do get a little warm, but never hot with continuous use. And most importantly, there is no flicker at all. Here is a slow-mo video I took on my iPhone with the exposure turned way down to achieve a fast shutter speed, and you can see the old fixture versus the new lights. That is definitely mission accomplished. And for those of you wondering about the economics of this project, the average going price of a comparable generic variable temperature video lighting panel is between $70 to $100. If you distribute my costs, per light bar I spent about $25 for LEDs, $3 on PWM controllers, $6 for aluminum, $20 for a 12 volt power brick that could power two different light bars, $5 for the die cast enclosure, $2 for HDPE, $8 for an articulating arm, and about $5 of miscellaneous components like coaxial plugs, wiring, fasteners, and aluminum scraps. Final tally, $69. Nice. $1 short of the off-the-shelf version, so that is mission accomplished. Oh, and there were also many hours in front of Fusion, my CNC, and my workbench spread out over three months, and there's the $400 I spent on a 3D printer. So, in the end, was this really worth it? Probably not but I got a solution that was exactly what I wanted and future light bars or smaller panels will be much faster to put together now. And if they're smaller, I'll be able to use cheaper power supplies, maybe I don't necessarily need that articulating arm, and a smaller panel wouldn't need as many LED segments so that would also cut costs. I now have the knowledge and leftover supplies to batch out several more lights faster and cheaper, even though I ultimately would not recommend this for the casual maker. But the most important takeaway for me is the journey. If I hadn't undertaken this project, I wouldn't have had the experience of designing a multi-part assembly like this from start to finish, gotten in some soldering practice, and made peace with my greatest enemy. And that last one may be what unlocks a new wave of creativity in this garage. And in times like these, that is absolutely priceless. I want to thank you all very much for watching, and I'll be back soon with more CNC projects, DIY nonsense, and occasional instances of 3D printing.